I've been spending a lot of time lately uh, modifying the shanks of woodruff and t-slot cutters in order to be able to produce the designs I get sent. Um, and it occurred to me if I have to make the shank smaller and move the shoulders back and re reduce the neck diameters that maybe something isn't being understood uh, at the design level about what these tools can do and what they can't do. And so I thought this uh, video might be helpful. Uh, so uh, any kind of undercut tooling, this set of knowledge I'm going to be passing along applies to. It could be uh, a lollipop style undercut ball end mill. It could be a T-slot cutter. It could have a radius. Um, it could be a dovetail. Um, the, the key piece of information I want to pass along is you need to be aware of the distance from the cutting edge to the neck and what what your design is forcing that neck diameter to be. Um, and you'll, you'll see the, the tooling implications of that as we go through some examples. So starting out, we'll start out with the uh, dovetail cutter. So in our, our CAD demo here, or CAM demo, we have a 60 degree dovetail starting out. And this is actually a pretty manufacturable feature. Um, the stock will get roughed to the, the narrowest diameter prior to dovetailing. So all this dovetail cutter is doing is, is cutting the, the angled portion. The, the, the cutter is kind of frail and um, there's not a lot of chip evacuation benefit uh, because the, the undercut feature chips really want to stay in the slot. So we try to do as little chip removal as possible anytime we're doing an undercut operation with the undercutting tool. Uh, so the dovetail cutter, we'll get it rough down the middle. We'll take a pass down the middle and these by nature are a couple thousandths under their nominal diameter, which allows us to then offset a tiny amount one way or the other and clean up the walls after we rough out the middle. Uh, you can get dovetail cutters with an extended neck if you need it to look like this. I will say that's not something I come across often, but the tooling exists if that's something you need. So now where this starts to get problematic is uh, in this figure, the neck diameter starts to close in. So this is the same base width. They're both half inch wide. This is a 60 degree dovetail and this one's a 45. So as that angle gets sharper, the neck distance starts to tighten up. So, as I said, uh, this is a perfectly manufacturable dovetail and the tool is readily available. You have this same width dovetail, but in 45 degrees, you can see how narrow the neck gets and there is not a commercially available tool for that. So that 45 degree dovetail either needs to get wider or shallower in order to get that neck distance to, to widen out. <clears throat> and. Uh, that's just really what you need to pay attention to. Um, you can kind of look at it in terms of step over, how much distance from the tip of the cutter to the side of the neck. Um, if that distance is greater than the neck diameter, um, it's probably not going to be viable. So the, uh, the other thing I wanted to say about dovetails is Generally, you need some kind of corner condition fillet at the top, um, especially in sealing solutions. Um, but we can't put a fully tangent radius on the dovetail because a lot of those uh, fillet cutters don't wrap around the corner. They stop at zero to 90 degrees. So it'd look like this. Uh, if you need a fully tangent radius, we're gonna have to use a undercutting ball mill and it, it really starts to balloon in price. Um, so consider just how much of a corner round you need there, if this is fine or if you need fully rounded. I understand if you do, but understand it's gonna cost more. Uh, also, if there's uh, provisions for a corner radius in the dovetail, that usually uh, allows us to use a radius dovetail cutter, which hold up a little better in uh, tougher materials. So, uh, 
in the same family of the dovetail is the uh, dovetail o-ring groove cutter and these are very problematic so uh, this is for face sealing o-ring grooves um, and you the reason you'd want a dovetailed wall there is it retains the groove um, so if it's in any orientation other than flat on a table getting those o-rings to stay in there while you bolt the assembly together can be a little challenging and uh, having just a little bit of taper on the wall will retain that um, <laughs> the problem is at your smaller sections of uh, o-ring the cutters so like let's say it's the smallest o-ring a uh, 1 16th section the cutter is 55 thousandths in diameter but the the thin neck portion is 18 thou um, it gets worse than that when you factor in the flutes so we'll look at the CAD model of the cutter. So yeah, that's 18 thou, but look at it from the front. When you, when you take away all that material for the flutes, now all of a sudden you just have this very small hourglass shape of material holding it all together. And so when I run this cutter, I don't run it like a 55 thousandths diameter cutter. I have to run it like an 18 thousandths diameter cutter because that's all the stiffer it is. So, uh, in order to run that tiny little dovetail cutter uh, around this, I don't have it illustrated, but it's m a lot of small step overs uh, at very, very uh, gentle feed per tooth feed rates. Uh, and it, it could be a very long run time, and there's not a lot of process security. Those cutters just die. So, uh, a design can, possibility you have is you could still have that same o-ring section but you can go to a drop hole or a half dovetail and that lets us for the same o-ring go to a much bigger cutter um, it basically adds 20 thousandths or a half a millimeter to the neck diameter and <clears throat> that doesn't sound like a lot but it doubles and uh, all of a sudden the process reliability just skyrockets as well as how much feed per tooth you can take. Uh, and so the way that works is you have this little scalloped out undercut hole that you would feed the cutter, which is wider than the top of the dovetail. So you'd feed it down in there and then you would, uh, you would kind of sneak around underneath the, underneath the lip of the dovetail. And so that little scallop allows you to get a bigger cutter than you would otherwise be allowed to get in there and uh, produce that dovetail. The half dovetail works the same way, um, but instead of that scallop, it's just the entire area is cleared out. And uh, in my experience, the half dovetail and the drop hole dovetail retain pretty much just as well, but there are applications where where it's going to be problematic if you do have a drop dovetail or half dovetail it needs to be on the high pressure side of the o-ring um, but ultimately if it could be just a regular old uh, straight walled o-ring groove we could put that in with a tree panning tool and that's like five seconds it just drills straight in and it also puts the corner fillets on at the top um, and it's just a very fast operation. And uh, there's also the factor of sealing. So uh, a tree panned groove is going to have machining marks that are circular. And then the O-ring will lay down in those circular grooves. Uh, whereas a dovetailed O-ring groove, the swirl marks will orbit around the O-ring groove. But what it creates is a a surface like this where you have these semicircular grooves and the OLED ring lays across them and so any surface roughness uh, it gives a, a path for leakage right across the side of the o-ring so a, a tree pan to groove seals uh, much better with the same mechanical roughness uh, just due to the orientation of the grain all right, so moving on to dovetails, we're gonna talk about side milling and T-slot cutters. 
Um, they look the same. They kind of cover a lot of the same features. There's a lot of overlap. Um, but there are some distinct differences in what they can do and how they're ground. So uh, I'll grab something more similar. A side milling cutter is really just meant to cut on the side. You can see the bottom isn't gashed out like the T-slot cutter. Neither is the top of it. Uh, it's really just meant to feed in from the side. Um, that being said, the finish, the bottom leaves, usually isn't terrible, but uh, it's not something you you rely on. Like if you had to chase a groove down a little, like your, your width needed opened up, um, it's going to have a lot of deflection. Whereas this one, the bottom of it's almost like a regular end mill, and it, it leaves a really nice floor finish. So um, you can see it's also gashed out so that every other tooth cuts on the top, bottom, top, bottom. And that really kind of reduces the cut pressure. Um, and as a result, they, they, they cut nice. There's a lot of room for the, the chip, whereas this one, the chip gashing is very close together, and you have to be careful. So the side milling cutters are really meant for operations uh, like this, where you're putting a groove in from the side, either on the outside or maybe it's inside of a big bore. Um, and in that regard, they're, they're very reliable. And uh, the tooling is built in such a way that, you know, there's a lot of systems like this where the, the tip screws on. And so the shanks can be quite long. You have quite a, quite a bit of options in terms of uh, flute length, edge radius, stuff like that. So you're, you really don't have to worry about design limitations with side milled grooves uh, too much. As long as there's ample space to get a cutter in a hole, it's not generally a problem. Uh, where we get into trouble is something that's more of a T-slot. So this feature is a T-slot. Um, and what makes it different than like the same feature or same cut feature? over here like this is a side groove this is t-slot but it's the same tool um, a side groove it's only cutting on one side you can take light passes to sneak into it uh, whereas a t-slot the the nature of the width of the cut and the neck diameter means you can't take any roughing passes it's one shot um, and then you might be able to take like a light spring pass to clean it up so uh, in terms of process reliability, this is a little more nerve-wracking because while the cutter is gashed to give a little more clearance for chips, um, it's still really difficult to evacuate chips out of a T-slot. And uh, they're, they're very unnerving to run. So where these get into trouble, same deal. The distance from the the edge of the cutter diameter to the neck. Um, right now, that step over amount is about a quarter of the cutter diameter. Um, step over amounts up to about a third of the cutter diameter are doable, but beyond that, it gets dicey uh, because the, the neck just gets too thin. So let's look at this one. This is manufacturable. Um, it's a half inch neck and a one inch wide T-slot. And the cutter's a little bit under and it goes down and has just enough room to take some spring passes. And that's doable. And so you think, okay, a quarter inch step over and a half inch wide neck, and you apply those same values to this L-shaped slot. Well, that becomes a problem because we can't use a one inch wide cutter. We have to go down to a three quarter inch wide, but we still have the same amount of step over. So now the neck becomes quite a bit smaller. Uh, and now this is starting to be on the verge of too thin of a neck. It's not gonna, not gonna run reliably because it's also not taking a balanced roughing cut. It's not cutting on both sides. It's only gonna be cutting on one side, which means you're probably gonna get a lot of deflection. That conjunction with the thin neck, it just really kind of makes it a problem. Another area we need to watch out for is blind features. So, um, like this slot, again, half inch wide slot, 
one inch wide T. Uh, you're used to those proportions, so you just use it, but we can only get a half inch wide cutter in because of the slot kind of choking down our cutter diameter, but we still need to step over a quarter inch and it creates a situation where you really have no shank. Um, I know what you're asking. Why would you need a blind T slot? Um, there's really no call for that since you couldn't get hardware in it. Um, but a lot of people see like those cam in style 80-20 T nuts uh, or like an M lock nut. Um, and so I see this, this design feature about once a year, and you also see something similar to this in fluid power. Um, you see a lot of like undercuts where it needs a very big diameter cutter with a very little neck in order to, uh, to pass fluid. Um, so I don't know. It's, it's definitely, uh, definitely something I see a lot, you know. So uh, if you do need a blind T-slot like this, consider a drop hole feature where we can get uh, a big hole or a big tool in the hole and start it and, and get that put in without much consequence. Uh, and lastly, I'm gonna close on a spot face. So um, you see this a lot in like cast components where you have a, a screw through hole and you just need to have a, a small light counterbore or a spot face to clean up the irregularity of the casting. Um, sometimes you can get a tool like this in there and you know go through the hole and, and hit that spot face. Um, but really uh, the, the length of the hole, the diameter of the hole and relative to the large diameter of the counterbore uh, often moves you into a specific class of tool called a, a back facing tool and the way those work is um, the shaft you know would go in the hole and then once it's in there through code motion or like uh, turning on the coolant on your machine a cutter uh, pops out and then you back up as it's spinning and then you retract the cutter and pull out uh, there's a lot of different versions of how that cutter is deployed depending on the manufacturer, but it's the same concept. Uh, they're expensive. Uh, they're a little unnerving to prove out for the first time, um, but they're very effective. Um, I know you're saying, why don't you just flip it over and mill that in? Uh, and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, machine tool applications, it's not viable. So like, let's look at my grinder here, for example. At the bottom of the base, you know, we have these counter bores connecting the, the column to the machine space. Uh, and uh, so to, to counter bore in these socket head screw counter bores, you'd need like a 40 inch long tool. Or you could just put them in from the bottom. Um, you know, come from the underside here and drill them in. And uh, that's what the manufacturer does, I'm sure. It's, it's just a lot easier to handle it that way. So that is uh, undercut features. Um, there are more varieties and tools and examples we could talk about, but I thought I'd try to, you know, just kind of push the core concept of tool diameter, neck diameter, and that step over amount. That's what you really have to pay attention to. Uh, hop on Harvey Tools website. They probably have the most comprehensive product line of these type of tools. And if you design a feature, chances are the people cutting it are probably gonna be using one of their tools. Um, for like the indexable stuff, PH Horn, this is an ISCAR. Um, familiarize yourself with what the tools are capable of doing in terms of step over, um, blade thickness, stuff like that, what the common tool corner radii are. Uh, and uh, it should reduce the amount of friction you see when you're trying to get something manufactured. So uh, thank you for watching. I, I hope this was helpful and uh, have a good day.